Well, good morning. It is great to have everyone here this morning. I um, feel like we are getting these little hints of spring. My wife and daughter and her kids just made it safely to Wisconsin. And that strikes me kind of as an oxymoron. Um, are you ever really safe in Wisconsin? <laughs> she, she sent pictures to Eric and me, and um, like when they're pulling into the house where my daughter who lives up there and her family stay, there's like dandruff all over the yard. Um, you know, just this white fluffy stuff, it's weird. Well, I don't know about you, but I am feeling a deep, deep loneliness, a deep um, desire to reconnect with the hour of sleep that I lost last night. Um, <laughs> yesterday, I had the privilege of attending a martial arts tournament. It was, it was a lot of fun. Uh, you may or may not know this, the group that's whooping in the back. Um, Scott and Teresa Brown, they have a martial arts school here in town. They are very active FBCers, and one of the things that's really cool with what they do with their program is that they connect it in with the truth of Scripture, and they use it as an opportunity to help their students come to know Christ and grow to become like Christ. And yesterday, they put on this program that drew people from all over the area. There were just tons and tons of people there. And a number of FBC youth were involved, right? And everything I hear, they did fantastic. Colin Kerfman, where are you? Yep. Um, that man's a beast. Um, So I walk into the gym yesterday where they're holding this because they'd asked me to come to the tournament and open it up in prayer. And I'm kind of walking around a little bit and I run into one of the girls from our youth group and she stops and talks to me and she looks at me and she says, there are some really scary looking people here. <laughs> I thought to myself, yeah, good to see you too. Um, <laughs> It's not like I didn't shower and shave or anything. I haven't participated in martial arts, but I've been involved with a lot of other sports, and especially track. Um, and I knew exactly what she was saying. I knew exactly what she was feeling. I know what it's like to walk into a large stadium with hundreds of competitors and think to myself, I have got to be the slowest person here. I know what it's like to have that knot in your stomach because you're just not sure that you're up for what you're about to face. And as we continue in our series about Jesus' final major conversation with his disciples before he goes to the cross, what we're calling the Upper Room Series because that's where he has his conversation, we find that the disciples are exactly... In one of those moments, they're in one of those moments where their stomach is in a knot. Jesus has just told them that he is leaving. And we saw in last week's passage, the implications of that would be that the disciples were going to face persecution from the world. They were going to face opposition. They were going to face rejection and even the threat of death. And where we pick up this week, we find that the disciples are dealing with the emotional consequences of that, the knot in their stomach. They are sorrowful, wondering how they are going to face what's ahead. And Jesus began to offer words of encouragement in last week's passage, and he's going to develop those words of encouragement this week by telling them what the Holy Spirit is going to do when he comes. Now, if you're going to understand today's passage, we need to back up a little bit and say something about who God is. See, because if you didn't grow up in church, then talk about things like the Father and the Holy Spirit's going to sound really strange to you. But the Bible teaches us a great deal about who God is and what he's like. And one of the things that we learn is that God is absolutely one. There is absolute unity within God, but yet he exists 
in three persons. And that sounds like really bad math. But here's what it means. Here's what it's trying to express. All three persons of the Trinity share equally and eternally all of the characteristics, all of the attributes of God. But each member is distinct. So in other words, the Father is completely God. And Jesus is completely God. And the Holy Spirit is completely God. But the Father is not Jesus. And Jesus is not the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is not the Father. They are one, but they are distinct. So that background is going to help you understand what Jesus tells the disciples in this passage. Now, interestingly, and we saw this exact same thing last week, at no point in this passage does Jesus tell the disciples to do anything. He just focuses on what the Holy Spirit is going to do. And so like last week's passage, Jesus is concerned about how the disciples think. Last week, he wanted them to understand that they're going to face opposition and rejection and persecution. And he gave them a hint of hope that the Holy Spirit is going to come and empower them. And in today's passage, Jesus details out that help. The Holy Spirit, who he calls the helper in this passage, will comfort them in their sorrow. happen but they will also remember that jesus knew it all along jesus is not surprised by what is coming now in the second part of verse four jesus explains why he has not gotten around to telling them this before and it's because jesus has been with them you see the point is while jesus was here all of the opposition was directed towards him if people had complaints, if people had disagreements, if people had frustrations, they were directed towards Jesus. And Jesus is making the point that this is about to change. And that's what's explained in verse 5. Jesus is going back to the Father. When he goes back, the disciples become the focus for all of the opposition. And then you've got this weird statement at the end of verse 5. Jesus says to them, no one's asking me where I'm going. Now, if you've been paying attention, if you've not been sleeping through the first parts of this series, that's going to sound really strange to you. Because that very question has been asked of Jesus twice so far. Once by, Philip, or once by Peter and once by Thomas. So what in the world is Jesus saying here? Well, I think it's something like this. Sometimes my daughter Katie will come over to our house in the morning... And she'll bring her kids with her. And she'll get there early enough that I haven't left for the house or left for the office. And when it's time for me to go, little Hannah will look at me and say, where are you going? And I will say to her, I'm going to work. I'm going to the office. And at that point, it becomes really, really clear that she couldn't care less where I'm going. That's not the point of her question. The point of her question is not where I'm going. She's concerned about the fact that I am going. Her question is a small protest. It's a way of saying that I better have a really good reason for leaving her and not sitting down and continuing to color with her. And I think something like that was what was going on with Peter and Thomas when they asked their question. The real question, the question behind the question, was more about why 
Jesus, are you leaving? And so in verse 5, what Jesus does is he actually focuses them. He said the where question really is important. You need to ask it. It matters that Jesus is going to the Father. The coming of the Holy Spirit is predicated on Jesus going to the Father and not going somewhere else. And because Jesus is returning to the Father, the Holy Spirit is going to come. So Jesus' message to the disciples has been that he is leaving to return to the Father. And that is going to bring persecution. And the result of that message to the, to the disciples has been that they reacted with sorrow. It says literally sorrow has filled their hearts. And Jesus uses some very powerful terminology when he talks about these things. The word that is translated sorrow has the idea of creating pain in your mind or in your spirit. And so Jesus is recognizing that pain has completely filled the core of who they are to the point that there isn't room for anything else. They are completely filled, taken up, consumed with grief. It isn't interesting how Jesus responds to their grief in verse 7. He takes truth and he sets it alongside how they're feeling. The fact that they are feeling grief is not a problem. Jesus doesn't condemn that. That they are not considering or, or thinking about the full picture is what the problem is. They are focused on part of what is true. And so what Jesus does is give them more of what is true. And what is true is that the Holy Spirit is coming. And the word that's translated helper has the idea of being a counselor, an advocate, a support, all rolled up into one concept. And Jesus is saying that their deep sorrow does not change what is true. Part of the truth is the fact that Jesus is leaving. Part of the truth is the fact that persecution is coming. But more of the truth, the rest of the truth, is that the Holy Spirit is coming too, and he will be a counselor, and he will be an advocate, and he will be a support. And they're going to receive the best, the most powerful, the most intimate support that they could possibly imagine. I want you to notice that Jesus refers to the Holy Spirit as he, not it. You will hear a lot of people refer to the Holy Spirit as it. Why does that matter? If you think the Holy Spirit is an it, then you will think that the Holy Spirit is kind of like the force in Star Wars. It's basically something that you tap into and ultimately try to control to gain control over your circumstances. But if you understand that the Holy Spirit is a he, then you understand that the Holy Spirit is a person. He engages with you he relates to you personally he cares about you personally he thinks about you he feels emotions for you and he has plans for you he loves you not as an it it's don't love he loves you as a person if you're a christian jesus promises to the disciples carry over to you as well and that includes the promise of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit actively lives in you. He cares for you. He supports you. He takes every situation in life and uses it to make you more like Jesus. He is constantly pointing you to Jesus. I want to stop here for a second. Because I get worried sometimes about how some Christians think about grief and sorrow. Sometimes Christians think that if they are deeply grieved, there is something wrong with them. If they are feeling deep sorrow, then it must be a sign that they don't love God enough or they don't trust God enough. Because if they did, they would never be sad. Now, I don't usually hear people say it that directly, but it will come out in statements that people make. Sometimes people will say things like, don't let this bother you. Just trust Jesus. Let go and let God. 
when they're talking to someone who's in pain. But do you catch that Jesus does not even begin to suggest that their sorrow was wrong? Jesus set the truth that they would have the Holy Spirit next to their sorrow. They had good reasons to be in sorrow, but their, those reasons were not the end of the situation. The events that led to sorrow would also lead them to know God more intimately. They would experience his care and his presence in ways that they could not even begin to imagine in the moment of their sorrow. How does that work out for us today? You live in a broken world. And that means sorrow is going to be part of your life. And there are people sitting here this morning that are in grief. They are in grief over the loss of a family member. They are grieving a child who has walked away or is making horrible decisions. They are grieving the loss of relationship or the loss of dreams or just the fact that life has not turned out the way they hoped. There are a lot of forms of sorrow that are sitting with us this morning. And these verses have something to say to you. Your sorrow is valid. It is okay to grieve. But next to that is the truth that God could not be closer to you. He indwells you. He grieves with you. And he has the ability to use horrible, painful, even evil situations to help you know Jesus better and become more like him. That may or may not be comfort for you in the moment. I don't know how much comfort it was for the disciples in the moment that Jesus gave it. But what the disciples would cover, discover and what we discover is that over time, as we live in that truth, that becomes more and more comforting. The disciples are sorrowful, and there's a good reason. Jesus is living, leaving, persecution is coming. Jesus promises the presence of the helper, the Holy Spirit. Jesus then goes on to explain that the Holy Spirit is not only at work in them to comfort them, he is also at work in the very world that opposes them. He will have a ministry of salvation to that world. We said last week, if you remember, what the world is. The world is that which opposes God. It refers to anything or anyone that stands against God. And if you're trying to live in a way that pleases God, you figure out in a hurry that you are out of step with the broader culture. I saw a real fascinating example of that yesterday at the martial arts tournament. Before the tournament started, Scott Brown, who was running the tournament, has this meeting with all the participants, and it's a meeting that's right out in the middle of the gym. And so also all of the audience is listening in on this meeting. And the idea of the meeting is to kind of set the ground rules for what's going to happen. And he certainly encouraged everyone to, that's competing, that they should compete to win. But what was really fascinating is how clear it was in what Scott said. That winning is not the highest value. It was far more important that people were treated well. Now, Scott didn't use biblical terms to talk about these things. But as a Christian, I knew what he was saying. I knew what was going on in his mind. What he was saying is that every single person, regardless of their ability, should be treated with the respect of someone who is made in God's image. Every single person, regardless of their talent or experience, should be treated with the compassion of someone for whom Jesus died. And if you stop and think about the context in which he's saying these things, how out of step that is with broader culture. The world says winning is everything. The world would look at Scott and Teresa and their students and say, you are fools to care more about the welfare of your opponent than trying to beat them. The world is not like Jesus. 
And that is what leads to persecution. But Jesus says in verse 8 that the Holy Spirit is not just at work in us. He is also at work in those very people who oppose God, those very people who oppose you. He is at work in the people who tell Scott and Teresa they are fools to care more about their opponents than about winning. He is at work in the people who think you are crazy for believing in Jesus and living like it. Verse 8 says that he is doing a work of conviction. This word that's translated conviction literally means to bring someone to the point where they recognize they have done wrong. Do you see that it's more than just feeling bad? It's more than an emotion. The feeling bad is a result of the conviction. Conviction is an awareness of what is true. Conviction is awareness that someone is guilty of something. It is awareness, Jesus says, of what is true about sin and righteousness and judgment. The Holy Spirit shows that the world is guilty of sin. Because the world does not believe in Jesus, they have no reason to think that what they do is wrong. You can't expect someone who is not a Christian to think and act like a Christian. They don't have the Holy Spirit living in them. But that doesn't mean the Holy Spirit's not at work in them. He prods them. He, he convicts them. He points out the fact that there is something wrong. There is something inside of them that is broken. That is the conviction of sin. Verse 10 says the Holy Spirit convicts the world of righteousness. Um, I'm sure I want to admit this. Who here has seen a dog show on TV? Yeah, okay. The, the emotionally healthy ones. Um, here's how dog shows work. Not that I have a lot of experience watching them. Um, dogs are paraded in front of a judge according to the type of dog that it is. You know, so Siberians are all kind of paraded, paraded in front of a judge who judges Siberian Huskies. And the idea is that a dog is judged based on how well it lives up to the ideal standard for that type of dog. So how well does this particular Siberian Husky live up to the ideal standard of a Siberian Husky? Or how well does this lab live up to the ideal of a lab? Now, it would be really helpful if at these competitions, they had dogs that perfectly matched the standard. Right, because then you can just take the dog that's being judged up to the dog that's the standard and kind of look at there and say, well, the tail's not quite right, ears aren't quite right, so, you know, it's good, but it's not, not great. But they don't have that. So what do the judges do? The judges have to create a mental picture of what the perfect standard looks like for that type of dog. What does the ideal Siberian Husky look like? What does the ideal black lab look like? What's going on in verse 10? Jesus is the ideal picture of righteousness. But he has gone back to heaven. So how does the world know what righteousness looks like? Where do they get their mental picture of what is truly right and truly wrong? Of what is good and what is bad? Of what is beautiful and what is repulsive? They get that picture from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives the picture to the world of what the ideal is to be. And if you've been with us through this series, what you may connect the dots on is that there's a particular tool that the Holy Spirit will very often use to give the world that picture. You know what that tool is? It's us. It's how we relate to one another. It's how we function together. That's why it's so important that we think deeply about how we relate to one another. Then verse 11 says, the Holy Spirit convicts the world of judgment. You see, when someone really grasps that they are broken, when they really get that the standard is way beyond them and there's nothing they can do about it, they realize that they stand judged. 
They realize they stand guilty before a perfect God. It talks about the ruler of the world, and I take that to refer to Satan. And I think it's almost this picture that's drawn as a contrast with Jesus, where just as Jesus was persecuted and so his followers are persecuted, Satan stands judged and condemned, and so will all those who are just like him. Jesus prepares the disciples for life in the world by assuring them that the Holy Spirit is at work in the very world that opposes them. When the Holy Spirit convicts the world, he's not just trying to make them feel bad. He's bringing them on the path toward salvation. And that gives me hope. That gives me hope that no person, no situation is beyond redemption. I just recently heard an amazing story of someone who at one point in her life was nowhere near the Lord. And it was the sort of situation that you would look at and think there is no way she would want anything to do with Jesus. But the story includes one persistent person who would again and again invite her to come to a Bible study and again and again would hear no until the Holy Spirit started the work of conviction. And she eventually came to the Bible study. And as she came to the Bible study, she came face to face with the reality that she was broken. She realized that there was a righteousness that she did not meet. And she realized that something had to be done. Now, not all of those realizations happened right away. This was a a process that took years to unfold. But the Holy Spirit faithfully, over time, worked in this person and convicted this person. And this person knows and walks with the Lord today. You know what's interesting? The person that invited her to the Bible study has no idea that this person became a Christian. Because they had moved, went separate directions. We just don't know how the Holy Spirit's working. How the Holy Spirit is changing the lives of people around us. The Holy Spirit is is at work in the broken world. And many of you can put faces and names to that brokenness. They might even be people who oppose you. But you can have hope. No person, no situation is beyond redemption. The Holy Spirit is at work in this world, and the Holy Spirit is at work in us. He comforts us. He convicts the world. But finally, he guides us. He has a ministry of guidance to the believers. I don't know that I've got this next story exactly right. Um, If I don't, that's okay, because it's a good story the way I remember it. Uh, Some people, some friends, who are actually here this morning, told me a story about their vacation to Central America. And during the vacation, they took this tour on four-by-fours through wilderness. Now, so if I get this picture right, there's kind of this small caravan of Jeeps going through rough but beautiful terrain. And it sounded absolutely amazing, except for one thing. At one point, the tour guide says to them, no matter what happens, don't get out of the Jeep. Okay. Every horror movie ever made has some version of that line in it. No matter what happens, don't get out of the car. No matter what happens, don't unlock the door. No matter what happens, don't jump out of the plane. Right, so the first thing that would go through my mind is, why in the world are you telling me this? And the tour guide answered that question. Because the area that they were in is filled with extremely poisonous snakes. In fact, they are so poisonous that if one bit you, you would not get to the hospital fast enough to save your life. At that point, I would be thinking about all of the reasons that I might have to get out of that Jeep. 
The Jeep is stuck. Can you help me push it? Nope. Going to wait for the helicopter. Um, there's a flat tire. Can you help me change it? Nope. I'm waiting for the helicopter. Another interesting thing about the guides is that they're really good at spotting the snakes, even when they are camouflaged in trees. And I think it was even like on a separate tour, it was a walking tour, which now why would you do that? Um, <laughs> that they had guides kind of pointing out, you know, over there, do you see right in that tree? That's, that's, one, of the, that's one of those snakes that will kill you. Um, you know, and over there, it's like, you know, the one following you, that's one of those snakes that will kill you. Um, but the idea is that these guys could see what everyone else couldn't. And they could point it out to you and they could keep you safe. That's what Jesus is saying the Holy Spirit does for Christians. Jesus' point in these verses is that there's more that he wants the disciples to know, but it's going to be the Holy Spirit who's going to communicate it. And so this picture that he creates in verses 12 and 13 is a picture of the Holy Spirit receiving truth from the Father, and then, like a tour guide, he's leading the disciples into truth, and as he's leading them, he's pointing out to them what they need to know to keep them safe. The Holy Spirit's work of communicating truth and guiding the believer glorifies Jesus according to verses 14 and 15. And that's because what the Holy Spirit says, what he declares, what he has to communicate is actually from Jesus himself. I think there are two reasons that this glorifies Jesus. One is the content of the truth reveals what Jesus is like. But in addition, and I think this is what's going on in verse 15... It becomes clearer and clearer to the follower of Jesus that Jesus really is fully God. Everything that the Father knows, Jesus knows. Everything that the Father possesses, Jesus possesses. How does this work out in our life today? How does the Holy Spirit guide us? Right? We wish it would be like a tour guide with a tour guide shirt and a tour guide hat who would tell us when it's safe to get out of our little safety zone and when it's not. And then later point out where the poisonous things are that will kill us. But the Holy Spirit doesn't seem to work that way. Now the question of how he guides us is a huge question and the answer is going to include God's word. It's going to include one another. It includes coming together for worship. But there are two things that I want to point out that I think are fairly common among Christians, but are very often missed as the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And the first one is pay attention to the different ways the Holy Spirit reminds you of the good news of the gospel. It just happened to me the other night. Ann and I were watching a TV show that's on the BBC called Father Brown. It's a murder mystery. And what was remarkable, you don't expect this in the middle of a murder mystery, especially one that's on the BBC. But in the middle of this show, there is a conversation between two characters about where is God when I am in grief. And I don't know who wrote this, but it was amazing and powerful for what the other characters said back in reply. Because what the other character did is he pointed to the cross. And he said, do you want to know that God knows what it's like to feel sorrow and to lose a child? Look at the cross. Do you want to know that God can relate to you in your sorrow? Look at the cross. This was just a TV show. It was just a silly murder mystery, but the Holy Spirit grabbed it. And it reminded me of how much God loves me. And I sat there blown away by the love of God for me in the middle of a murder mystery. And God does that with us all the time. It might be through a song. It might be through a comment someone makes. It might be through a movie that we're watching. It could be anything. Pay attention to how the Holy Spirit is constantly using the small things of life to remind us This is what Jesus is like. This is what his righteousness is like. This is what his love is like, his grace and his forgiveness, because it happens around us all the time. 
The second one is a lot more common to our experience, and we're more aware of it as an experience of the Holy Spirit. But I think often we get, we get it wrong in how to interpret it. We need to pay attention to how the Holy Spirit makes us aware of sin. Right? He convicts us just like he convicts the world. And there are moments that we know that what we are thinking or doing is wrong because the Holy Spirit is prodding us. And when you experience those moments, what you have to remember is that this is not an act of condemnation by the Holy Spirit. It is an act of love. And so, so often what we do when the Holy Spirit convicts us is we beat ourselves up. But what we should do is go to the Holy Spirit with thanksgiving. Thank him for making you aware. Thank him for guiding you into the truth that you need to know about yourself and God's righteousness. And thank him that you are forgiven and that he is at work in you to change you. Jesus is shaping how we think. He is preparing us for life in a world that opposes us. And he's preparing us by showing us how the Holy Spirit works. The Holy Spirit is our helper. And that, mean he com- that means he comforts us and he supports us. He convicts the world that opposes us. And for many, that will be the first step towards salvation. He guides us through the world very often with the small daily things that remind us of God's love and our need for it. So the point that Jesus is making to the disciples and to us is that we can face a world that opposes us because of the comforting, convicting, and guiding work of the Spirit. I was reminded yesterday that there are a lot of scary-looking people here. And we're not just talking about a martial arts tournament or FBC. We're talking about life in a fallen world. Life filled with brokenness and sorrow. And if you have a knot in your stomach because you wonder if you are up to facing it, well, the answer is no. You are not up to facing it. You're not up to facing it alone. But you are not alone. So how do we respond? And I want to suggest four ways. And I'll remind you, too, that when you received one of these when you came in, there is a place for you to respond to the message on the back, and you can tear that off and put it in one of the boxes that's in the foyer. And we as a staff will take those, and we will pray for you as you seek to apply God's word. But here are four ways that you can think about applying this passage. First, again, always encourage you to share with one another the discussion questions. Talk about it as a family. Talk about it with a friend. Go back through and reread the passage and list everything it says about the Holy Spirit, what he is like, what he does. Spend time in prayer every day asking the Holy Spirit for guidance. And I know not everyone journals, but some people do. And if you are a journaler, start keeping track of how you see the Holy Spirit convicting you and guiding you in life. And even if you're not a journalist, or someone who journals, um, just keep mental track of that. The world opposes you. The Holy Spirit comforts, convicts, and guides. And that is our comfort. I'm going to invite the prayer team to come forward. We would ask that you would stand with me as we close in prayer. Why do we need to pray? Why do we need to join others in prayer? Because you cannot face on your own a world that opposes you. And so we want to stand with you and pray with you as you face that world. So whatever you need prayer about, whether it's opposition you're facing, a struggle, if you want to just know Jesus, the Savior who loves you, and you want the Holy Spirit in your life, Come talk to one of us about that as well. Would you pray with me? Father, we are so amazed that you love us and you pursue us. Or we are so amazed that your spirit actually dwells within us. 
And I, I confess, I don't even understand how intimate that is. But I know the very person and presence of God is in my life, at work in my life, changing my life, comforting me, pointing me, helping me to become more like your son. And Lord, I know that is true with everyone here who is a follower of Jesus. And I ask, Lord, that you would help us to live in confidence in that, regardless of whatever we are facing. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Before you go, let me leave you with this thought. You are not the spiritual Marines. What do I mean by that? You are not the one that goes first into the battle. The Holy Spirit has gone ahead of you. And the Holy Spirit is at work. When you walk out of this room, you are walking into a world where the Holy Spirit is alive, active, and already at work. So leave here with the confidence that you are joining the work that he is doing. You are dismissed.